Over the past 10 years, urban gondolas have become all the rage, with cities far and wide astonished with the discovery of this humble ski lift. But urban cable transportation isn't actually something new, so should we really be diving headfirst into the latest transit trend? Are gondolas just gadget bonds? Well, let's find out. The explosion in urban gondolas, and the even bigger explosion of social media posts by urbanists excited by urban gondolas, was clearly started by the Metro Cable System in Medellin, Colombia. A system that has now grown to six different lines serving the hilly metropolis. Now, some do say that the Metro Cable was the original urban gondola system, and I think that's kind of up for debate. But what isn't debatable is that it definitely got people talking, and also connected into a great network of rail, bus rapid transit, and perhaps the world's only justified translore system. Now, probably the most impressive new urban gondola system in the world is actually not in Medellin, but in La Paz, Bolivia, where the Mi Teleferico system has 10 different lines with nearly 40 gondola stations. So much that it's ended up looking a lot like a metro system on a map, but with gondolas. But you want to know, do gondola systems actually make sense? Should my city be building a gondola system? For starters, it's actually worth discussing what a gondola is and how it's different from a cable car. A gondola is an overhead cable-based transportation system where small cabins are carried and pulled along by a single cable which they hang off of, which will be running between two or more stations. The gondolas don't actually stop entirely within stations, but detach from the high-speed cable and slow down so people can board and deboard them. And this is actually pretty nice because the gondolas tend to have quite good level boarding within stations. In fact, some new gondola systems even have the ability to pull a gondola out of the flow, stop it entirely, and then reattach it later so that people who need even better accessibility can get onto a stationary gondola cabin. By comparison, a cable car, but not that type of cable car, is a system which consists of one or two large cabins that shuttle back and forth, with separate cables supporting and pulling them along. These systems will stop entirely at either end of their run, and since they aren't continuous, passengers do typically have to wait quite a bit longer. They're also sometimes known as aerial tramways, and such systems have actually existed in urban areas for around a century. A good example of such a system is the Roosevelt Island Aerial Tram in New York. Now, these aerial tram systems are actually related to funiculars, which are essentially trains that use a cable to pull them up a hill. The main connection here being that in both funiculars and aerial tram systems, you tend to have two vehicles which shuttle back and forth, and when being used on a hill, this means that one vehicle traveling down can help assist pulling the other vehicle traveling up, making them much more energy efficient. You'll also often hear people, the type of people who would watch a cable-based transport YouTube video, ask, why not just build a funicular whenever a gondola is brought up? And the answer is pretty simple. Funiculars like trains tend to need their own right of way. And when you're going up a hillside, this can be pretty difficult to manage when you have existing roads, homes, and the like. Now, while you can put a funicular on an elevated guideway or even in a tunnel, as many older urban systems did, this tends to not make a lot of sense because funiculars are not that high capacity and tunnels and elevated guideway are quite expensive. By comparison, a gondola or aerial tramway tends to only need a periodic tower to support its cables along its right of way, which is a lot less expensive and also less land intensive to build. So then where do such systems actually make sense? Well, it's not that complicated. Generally in hilly places, go figure, ski lifts, or in places with difficult terrain, like for example, a river crossing, or potentially when traveling over dense, highly developed areas that would be difficult to otherwise get around. Now, to be completely fair, these are all places which definitely do exist in a lot of urban areas. And gondolas do have a lot of features that make them appealing. For one, as mentioned before, gondolas tend to have a pretty minimal footprint. And even the stations aren't all that big. And in places like Medellin, the stations are sometimes doing double duty as a community center or something like that. The systems also aren't very loud, so you can't really hear them unless you're directly underneath. Another nice feature is that the systems don't have crazy staffing requirements, a handful of people, and you get a fairly high capacity transit line. 
They also do provide excellent service, since in most cases cabins run continuously, though there are some interesting systems where cabins kind of group up to form a train. Maybe I'll make a video about that in the future. That being said, if it is super crowded, you may have to wait to get on a cabin because the lack of large vehicles arriving means that only a few people can go at any given time. Basically, gondolas tend to work with the type of passenger flow where you have a steady trickle of people who can walk on immediately when they get to a station. It's basically infinite frequency, but work less well when you have a whole rush of people arriving at once and then lines have to be formed. To be fair, the systems are also very easy to install. They can be built much more quickly than more traditional guideway transit systems, and that's partially because they tend to not be super expensive and the limited footprint means you don't need all that much land for them. At the same time, ski lift companies have built a lot of ski lifts, and so they have a ton of experience and are quite capable of constructing systems quickly. Now, you might not like the idea of people flying overhead and seeing that giant train layout you've been building in your backyard. But don't worry, because some gondola systems have actually incorporated electrochromic glass into their cabins so that the cabin's windows can essentially become frosted when traveling by a particularly sensitive area. So that's kind of a cool feature, and you actually do see that on some metro systems as well. Now, perhaps best of all, compared to driving, buses, or even better electric buses, gondolas are really easy to make 100% electric, powered by renewable energy. Because of a lot of these great features, cities like Istanbul and Mexico City, make sure you're subscribed for a video on Mexico City very soon, have used urban gondolas to connect hard to reach neighborhoods in hilly areas and other trip generators like university campuses. Even cities known for extremely picky aesthetics and big transit systems like Paris are getting onto the urban gondola trend. They're actually building a system there right now. And as it turns out, even my hometown of Vancouver is planning to build an urban gondola to connect to the mountaintop university campus of SFU. At the moment, the university campus is served by a number of bus routes, but they tend to be quite congested and they struggle to get up the hill in the winter. And that means the university campus actually sometimes has to close if it gets particularly snowy, which doesn't happen all that often in Vancouver. Even more interesting, SFU has actually planned to have a 3S gondola. A 3S gondola is sort of like a hybrid between an aerial tram and a regular gondola. It has three cables like most aerial tram systems, so two of the cables are used to support the cabin and one cable is used to pull it along. The extra cables mean you can have much larger gondola cabins, which can carry more than 30 people, when compared to a traditional gondola with around 10. And just like a gondola, as opposed to an aerial tramway, these systems operate continuously. So when you walk into a station, there will be a few gondola cabins slowly working their way through that you can hop onto. But are all of these cable-based systems just gadget bonds? Now, I personally have a bit of a connection to cable-based transportation because I spent a lot of my life skiing. And what I will say is that for the most part, gondolas tend to do their job for that application really well. They're also quite cost effective and really standardized, so I don't think it's fair to call them gadget bonds. They're just a very specific transportation tool for very specific transportation problems. Unfortunately though, the needs of urban transport tend to be quite different from the needs of ski hills. So what are the limitations of these systems? Well, for one, the uptime of gondola and cable-based transit systems in general can be less than ideal. For example, ski lifts tend to shut down overnight, as well as during the off-season. And longer-term shutdowns are sometimes required for major works like cable replacement, which, unlike in a rail system, can't be done while the system is still operating, even at a lower level. Now, none of this is to say that a gondola couldn't operate similar to other transit services, from early in the morning to late in the evening, with a cable replacement every couple of years, which isn't all that bad. It's not unusual for a longer term shutdown to happen every couple of years on a major metro line, for example, at least in big cities. But the necessity of shutting the system down for major maintenance, even if it is infrequently, means that these systems just aren't really ideal for high capacity or incredibly important routes. One solution that you've seen develop over time for these problems is that many ski lifts have a lot of redundancy. You'll have multiple lifts working their way up the hill so that if one does have to be shut down for part of a season or for some period of time, people can just take other lifts. But you won't necessarily see this in a lot of urban gondola applications. Gondolas can also be quite susceptible to high winds, which are going to be more common as I talked about in a recent video about climate change and transit resiliency. 
If you've ever ridden a gondola, or a chairlift for that matter, in very high winds, all of the shaking and swinging and bobbing can be kind of terrifying. And systems do actually have to sometimes shut down if conditions get particularly bad. Now, to be fair, there are other types of gondola systems, like 3S gondolas, for example, that are more resilient to bad weather conditions because they have additional stability provided by additional cables. But still, gondolas are going to be more susceptible than, say, a funicular at ground level, not to mention a funicular underground or even just buses. A bigger issue is probably capacity. Even a higher capacity 3S gondola system only has around the same capacity as a very high capacity bus route. And this means that gondolas just aren't really suited for true mass transit applications. That being said, the staffing costs and potentially even the long-term maintenance of a gondola compared to buses operating on a very difficult route, for example, going uphill, actually can make them cost competitive with buses, but in certain applications. Speeds can also be an issue. Gondolas actually can travel quite fast, typically over 25 kilometers per hour, but traditional transit, including buses, can also operate quite fast on the type of sparsely stopping routes that you tend to see gondolas used for. Gondolas also can't super easily turn. Because of the use of cables, for a gondola system to turn, you tend to have to have several straight segments separated by stations which have a turn built into them. Now, I do want to reiterate, gondolas are not gadget bonds. But sort of like a lot of gadget bonds, there's a very specific place where gondolas make a lot of sense, and many places where they might be tempting, but probably don't make sense. And the many particular and unique drawbacks and pluses of gondola systems means that transportation planners need to really understand the technology to plan optimal routes that use it. Now more concerningly, at the same time, the low cost and relative visibility of gondolas, as well as their frequent use at amusement parks and ski resorts, can make them particularly attractive to politicians who want to build a white ele legacy project. Sort of like gadget bonds, which aren't really all that effective for actual passenger transportation. Probably the best example of this is in London, where the cable car, affectionately known as the Dangleway, essentially duplicates existing rail routes across the River Thames, but more slowly and with less capacity. As far as I could tell when I was in London, and I did get on the Dangleway, it was entirely used by tourists. So while gondolas can absolutely be a good option for urban transportation, you need to ask a lot of questions, and there are alternatives. Funiculars, for example, certainly have their uses in extremely dense or high capacity applications. And some cities like Hong Kong and even Medellin, those folks really seem to build unique transit applications, have even experimented with covered outdoor escalators and moving walkways to help residents get up and through hilly, dense areas. In some cases, you could also just build a train. So why are gondolas so popular if they only really work in very specific places and are some sort of universal transportation panacea? Well, I'd kind of say novelty. Gondolas, at least in many places, are a new and useful transportation technology. And those don't actually come along very often. And since gondolas can legitimately solve some real transportation problems quite affordably, they're very tempting to use and very powerful. You just have to make sure they actually make sense for your city. Thanks for watching.